afternoon, everyone. I'm Francesco Mancini. I'm an associate dean and associate professor at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. Um, great honor to, to be here today and to chair this panel. Uh, we're moving now to the second scenario of, of our overall competitive uh, day, uh, the Arab-Israeli conflict, uh, with a particular emphasis on, on the 70s uh, period. Uh, and we have uh, two papers, um, uh, one uh, by Professor uh, Emeritus John Quigley, and the second one co-authored by Dr. Jessica White and uh, Dr. Iab Shalbak. Um, as previously, uh, the uh, presenter will have 25 minutes to uh, present their paper, and then we can open up to uh, questions and answers. So let me start with uh, uh, Professor John Quigley. He doesn't really require much introduction to this crowd. As a professor emeritus uh, at the Moritz uh, College of Law uh, at the Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio, as a specialist in public international law, having instructed in the subject since the 70s, the early 70s. Um, he has authored a dozen of books in the field of law and, and several hundred scholarly articles. And I want to just remind two particular recent books. One is The Six-Day War and the Israel Self-Defense, which is obviously very relevant to what we're discussing today. Uh, and the other one, for those who are more interested in Southeast Asia, is on genocide in Cambodia. It's uh, the documents from the trial of Pol Pot and, and uh, Yang Sari. So, uh, interesting uh, studies on uh, on uh, on the Cambodian genocide. Um, without further ado, as it turns out, I'm not the only speaker from the Ohio State University here today. Um, anyone guess who the other one is? <laughs> Professor Richard Falk. Uh, he's my predecessor uh, in teaching international law uh, in, in Ohio, uh, very early in his career. So when he was writing these uh, uh, papers about for the Lawyers Committee, uh, he, he was at my university. Um, but uh, I am impressed uh, with the, the connections between the two conflicts that I really didn't fully grasp when I first got uh, an email from, from uh, Professor Catan uh, suggesting the, this topic. Uh, but um, uh, the question of statehood, uh, we were talking about the you know, South Vietnam, North Vietnam, of course, Palestine, and is Palestine a state now, um, is, a, is a major issue in how you define what it, what it means to be uh, a state. And this came up for the International Criminal Court uh, a few years ago when Palestine filed uh, a, a declaration giving jurisdiction over the, the, uh, the, ninth, the, the 2008 war um, and the ICC. Uh, well, I communicated with the prosecutor about it and told him that, uh, yeah, Palestine's a state and it's not a problem. <laughs> you should uh, d decide it that way. Um, and they, then he invited me and some others to come to The Hague and ar argue the matter. So we had a knockdown, drag out fight in, in The Hague uh, with, with uh, uh, some of us arguing for Palestine being a state and, and others against. Um, but the, uh, in, in Vietnam, of course, one of the aspects of the uh, 1954 agreement with the drawing of the demarcation line was that there was supposed to be an election throughout the entire country. And that was one of the conditions for drawing the demarcation line. Uh, but then the United States, uh, in, in particular, uh, kind of maneuvered uh, away from that election uh, occurring, and then the, 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 the line became uh, uh, one of some permanence well, uh, until, until 1975. Um, uh, and it, the, the end of that line came more rapidly than many of us had thought. In January of 1975, I attended a meeting with lawyers from, from the Democratic Republic of Vietnam, uh, and we were trying to figure out uh, uh, legal angles uh, that we could take, new legal angles about the war. And at that point, the National Liberation Front was occupying a good bit of territory in the southern part of, of Vietnam. Um, so the, out of our discussions came the idea that, that we should promote the notion that the National uh, Liberation 
Asian Front was the legitimate government uh, of South Vietnam. Uh, so I, I scribbled very quickly uh, a draft of, a, of a, an article, a law article, arguing that the National Liberation Front should be recognized rather than the Republic of, of, of Vietnam uh, in Saigon. Um, uh, and I got my drafting done in uh, March of 1975. So you can imagine what happened to my article uh, with April 1975. It became irrelevant. Uh, and you had a single, single Vietnam. Um, but but these these questions of of, of statehood and and, uh, and recognition are, uh, are are common to the to the uh, two situations. The the question of reprisals too that Professor Cuddy was talking about. Uh, uh, I think he mentioned th that there were uh, Middle East connections on that. Uh, all during the 1950s, the Israeli government was making attacks into Jordan uh, in response to raids from uh, Palestinian refugees who were raiding back into, the, into their own territory from which they were being illegally excluded. Uh, and the um, uh, the government of, of Israel engaged in some very major raids that were then uh, brought up in the Security Council of the United Nations. Uh, and its justification was namely reprisal, uh, that these are uh, reprisals. Um, that is, in those instances when it acknowledged, in many instances it didn't acknowledge. And that's one of the problems with reprisals, is, is that uh, you never know what the truth is. The, the Israeli government, in a number of situations, when it went into Jordan in the 1950s, uh, made the argument that it had not, in fact, gone into Jordan, but that it had been some uh, Israeli civilians uh, who had gone in and killed large numbers of, of, uh, of Jordanians and Palestinians in, in Jordan. Uh, and this was a, a blatant lie. Uh, and the United States uh, uh, recognized that it was a lie in, in a couple of major situations. And the Security Council condemned Israel for, for reprisals. So that, that was in the 50s. So you have that background when the issue of reprisals comes up in, in, in Vietnam. Um, I, I'm not going to say that the Eis that was the Eisenhower administration. I'm not going to say that they were doing it because of their respect for international law. Uh, at the same time, the Eisenhower administration was illegally sending troops, uh, Marines, into Lebanon in 1958. It sponsored a, uh, a secret war in Indonesia against communists in, in uh, the 1950s. Uh, it sponsored the overthrow of the government of Guatemala in 1954, and it started the the, uh, the Bay of Pigs operation that was completed by, by President Kennedy uh, in, in Cuba. Uh, all of these being quite illegal under international law. Um, uh, so I, I, I'm, I'm not going to say that the Eisenhower administration w w was doing it out of, out of respect for the, the, the law. Um, but um, uh, but also this this question of the uh, of states that uh, can't take care of their territory and therefore it's okay to invade them, um, which which came up this morning. That that of course has been a major issue. One of the uh, uh, scholars that that actually dealt with it uh, was Sharif Basiuni, an Egyptian, uh, in connection with the. Uh, American invasion of uh, Afghanistan in 2001. And I wrote a law review article in 2002 arguing that the invasion of Afghanistan could not be justified on the grounds that, that the government wasn't able to uh, uh, take care of its own territory. Uh, uh, and one of the, uh, the sources that I cited was, was Sharif Basiuni, the Egyptian-American Egyptian uh, uh, international lawyer. Um, but um, we're on to the 1970s, yes? Okay. Yep. Uh, I promise. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, the, um, this is a, a very interesting issue of, of, of legality, namely um, the uh, uh, action by Egypt and Syria against Israel in, um, in 1973. Um, uh, interesting in a number of ways. When, when that 
uh, situation uh, started when, when there were first hostilities. This was along the, the Suez Canal, uh, with Egypt moving across the canal into uh, its own Sinai Peninsula, which at that point was occupied by Israel, uh, and Syria moving into the Golan Heights, which uh, uh, also was occupied by, uh, by uh, Israel. And when that happened, James Schlesinger, who had been the director of the CIA and at that time was the national security uh, advisor in the in the White House his first reaction was oh Israel must have started this <laughs> why because Israel always starts wars uh, this is the CIA talking this is not me talking this is the Central Intelligence Agency uh, all during the, the 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 period leading up to the 1967 war uh, the CIA was analyzing what was going on uh, as between Egypt and Israel um, uh, and uh, was confident that Egypt was not about to attack uh, Israel. Abe, Abe Iban, as the uh, uh, foreign minister of Israel, was was coming to the White House uh, trying to convince the, the Johnson administration that Egypt was about to attack uh, and that uh, the United States should give uh, Israel the uh, kind of permission, you might say, uh, to uh, to invade uh, Egypt. Uh, and Johnson kept telling Abba Ibn, you know, look at the CIA reports. They're saying you're crazy. Uh, there's no chance that Egypt is, is going to uh, uh, to uh, uh, invade. Um, uh, but but this is important background to what occurred in 1973 because in 1973, essentially, uh, Egypt and Syria were attacking back into their own territory, which had been uh, occupied by by Israel since the uh, the 1967 war, uh, and their view was, this is our territory, it was taken by aggression, uh, and, and uh, the United Nations should help us get it back, but it is not doing so, uh, so how long can we wait? It's now what, seven years since 1967. Um, um, they didn't quite say it that way uh, because at the uh, end of the, of the fighting in 1967, the Security Council had adopted resolutions for a ceasefire. Uh, and so uh, any initiation of hostilities by Egypt and Syria would be a violation of the, of the ceasefire. Uh, so they didn't acknowledge that they started the, the hostilities. Um, uh, they claimed that it was by, uh, by Israel. Uh, but then when it got into argumentation in the Security Council, they, they also uh, you know, made the argument that this was territory of theirs and, and that, they, uh, you know, that they couldn't wait forever for the, uh, for the Security Council to act. Um, uh, but uh, but it, the 1973 hostilities really are a continuation of the 1967 war. Joram Dinstein, who's the uh, uh, international law professor, and I think now emeritus at Tel Aviv University, uh, has has said that uh, there really isn't a 1973 war. It's just a, a continuation of the 1967 war. So he he uh, he, he questions uh, just the the, the nomenclature. Um, uh, but as I say, the the view of Egypt and Syria was that their territory had been taken by uh, aggression, which which uh, is is uh, uh, was accurate. Um, you may have noticed um, uh, on uh, uh, Dr. Catan's uh, uh, New York Times from 1967, if you read down to the subtitles, it said something like, each side accuses the other of striking first. Um, uh, and that is true. Each side went into the Security Council uh, and said the other side had struck first. Egypt was telling the truth. Israel was not. Um, what Israel did was to make up a story that Egypt had, uh, had sent uh, shells, mortars, into three villages in southern Israel, and that that was the trigger for the attack by Israel that then went into Sinai uh, and, and then later, a couple days later, into the Golan Heights. Um, uh, that was a false story. I mean, there were no such 
instances of shelling by by Egypt. It was a, it was a totally uh, a fictitious story. Um, and this is a problem too with reprisals. <laughs> the the, the uh, uh, August 1964, the Vietnam. Uh, situation in the Gulf of Tonkin that was mentioned this morning. Um, uh, that was a, a totally fictitious uh, story on the part of the United States. There was actually no uh, firing on, on the two U.S. vessels that supposedly had been fired upon. Um, uh, what happened was that uh, the, the vessels had reported that they had been fired upon. Um, uh, and then within a short time, they sent another message to Washington saying, oh, we were wrong about that. We actually weren't fired upon. They apparently had mistaken the, their own rudders, the noise from their rudders as, as being some noise from, uh, from outside. Uh, and they clearly informed Lyndon Johnson of that. But Lyndon Johnson didn't care that it was a phony story. He went to Congress and got it to adopt a resolution called the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, which then was the legal basis in domestic U.S. law uh, for, the, uh, for the action in Vietnam. Um, uh, but um, but with, with, with Israel, you, you had the same thing. Um, uh, Abba Iban was going to Washington, as I say, uh, in the, this is the last week of May 1967, uh, saying, you know, please give us an okay to go into Egypt and to attack Egypt. Because in 1956, when they had done the same thing, the Eisenhower administration went into the UN and forced them to withdraw immediately. Well, within a couple of months. Uh, and they were afraid that the Johnson administration might do the same thing. So they, they wanted the Johnson administration's uh, authorization, you might say, uh, beforehand. Um, uh, but the Johnson administration w would not give it. Um, uh, the Johnson administration said, do not fire the first shot against Egypt. So at that point, the Israelis came up with a plan. Their plan was they were going to send a ship through the Straits of Tehran leading into the Gulf of Aqaba. Uh, and they figured that the Egyptians would fire on this ship. And then they could say, ah, the Egyptians fired the first shot. Uh, now we'll, we'll in invade into the Sinai. Uh, and they, they had this plan rather well advanced. They bought an old ship uh, and outfitted it um, uh, and put it into a port in, in East Africa, in the port of Asmara and in, in, in the east coast of Africa. Um, uh, they called it the Dolphin, where they named the ship the Dolphin. Um, uh, and then uh, they went to Washington and said to the Johnson administration, look, we've got this plan. Uh, you're telling us not to fire the first shot, but what if Egypt fires the first shot? Is that good enough? Will, will you then you know, not, tell, not go into the Security Council and, and, and try to get us to withdraw? Um, uh, but before they got an answer on, on that, um, they, they went ahead and, and invaded uh, uh, Egypt uh, uh, anyway. They finally gave up on getting the authorization of the United States. Uh, just about two days before they invaded Egypt, uh, Meyer Amit, who was the director of the Mossad, the Israeli intelligence, went to Washington. Uh, and instead of uh, asking for permission, he told Robert McNamara, the, the Secretary of Defense, we're going to do it. What are you going to do? Uh, and he came away uh, convinced that uh, Robert McNamara would sit on his hands and would not object very much uh, and that the United States would keep quiet about it. Um, and so then they went ahead. And they were right. The United States covered for, for Israel in the, in the Security Council when, when Egypt went in and said we were attacked by Egypt. Um, uh, when the Israelis attacked, they, they did send uh, letters, similar letters, to, uh, to Mr. Kasigan, the premier of the Soviet Union, and to Lyndon Johnson as the president of the United States, explaining uh, what had happened. And in each letter, they mentioned these three towns in southern Israel that supposedly had been attacked by Egypt 
on the morning of the 5th of June, 1967. Uh, it, it, and as I say, that was a totally fictitious story, um, which they came up with at the very last minute because they didn't go with the dolphin plan. On the 1st of June, Moshe Dayan took over as, Secretary, as uh, defense minister for Israel. Uh, and the, the dolphin plan was quite well advanced at that point. The, the, the uh, IDF personnel was already in their ship waiting for orders to sail into the Straits of Tehran. Moshe Dayan never gave the order. Uh, on the 3rd of June, uh, he decided that it was a bad plan because he was afraid that the Egyptians would be smart enough not to fire on the ship. <laughs> Uh, uh, and then it would be obvious that the Israelis were up to up to something, so so that uh, that left them with no plan. So they only had about 24 hours to come up with some new kind of pretext for invading Egypt. And the pretext was that the, these uh, uh, supposed uh, shellings. Uh, they also said that Egyptian. Uh, um, planes were on their way to attack Israel and that the Israeli radar showed that on the morning of the 5th of June. That too was, was total fiction and they were never able to, to back that up with, with any you know, evidence that, that uh, their radar had ever uh, uh, shown that. Uh, so you have the, uh, oh my, I haven't gotten to the 73 war yet. Um, uh, <laughs> Okay, um, uh, but um, the uh, uh, the war was resolved without any serious discussion about the legalities. The United States, uh, uh, you know, evaded the question of legality. So we're, we've been talking this morning about about the role of international law. Uh, essentially. The, the United States avoided international law and said what we need to do is to come up with an overall plan for the Middle East. We shouldn't talk about who started the war. Uh, maybe it was one, that's kind of a Trump thing, and maybe it was somebody else, who knows. Um, but we'll, uh, uh, we'll, we'll then go in, into a, a broader discussion. Um, uh, and, and that was that didn't sit very well, of course, with, with Syria and Egypt, which had uh, had been the the, the victims of, uh, of an attack. Uh, but then, all through the the the. the next period of time, the Security Council supposedly was working on trying to get Israel out. Um, uh, and the, the Secretary General of the UN appointed Gunnar Yaring, a name that might be familiar to some of you, a, a diplomat who, who took on the task of trying to, uh, to negotiate the situation as between uh, Egypt and Syria on the one hand and Israel on the other, uh, uh, and he finally gave up and, and put the onus on Israel for refusing to engage in any serious uh, discussion and for refusing to withdraw. Um, uh, uh, and finally, the, the, the matter went to the Security Council in the summer of 1973 with a draft resolution that would have required Israel to withdraw. And that resolution almost passed in the Security Council. The reason it did not pass was that it was vetoed by the United States. Um, so it was in that posture that, the, uh, uh, that Egypt and Syria uh, attacked. Um, uh, there was no criticism of Egypt and Syria for that attack uh, in, in the Security Council. Um, uh, and interestingly, in 1967, uh, on the question of the legality of the hostilities, there was not a single country that backed up Israel w with its view that uh, that Egypt had had started the the hostilities. Not a single one. Not even the United States. The United States kept quiet. Uh, the U.S. Ambassador Goldberg was in private discussions with the Israeli ambassador saying, what can we do for you? Uh, and the Israeli ambassador said, just keep quiet, just keep quiet, you know, don't, don't talk about what happened. Uh, and, and that's what the United States uh, did. Uh, and similarly, in 1973, it was it was clearly on on Israel's side. Uh, uh, you can read the memoirs of Henry Kissinger, one of my teachers. I'm sorry to say, uh, um, uh, who uh, I hope I didn't learn too much from him. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, 
he, he basically took the position, well, we're on Israel's side, so, you know, we have to be on Israel's side. Uh, um, uh, so we, we veto the resolution in the, in the Security Council, uh, and, and that uh, uh, that was the position the U.S. Uh, took. Um, but in the discussions that did occur in the Security Council at that point, uh, there was absolutely no criticism, no criticism of Egypt and Syria, uh, except from, uh, from Israel. Um, uh, the other countries either supported Israel, uh, supported Egypt and Syria, uh, or, or they didn't say anything uh, at all. So in both of those, uh, uh, sets of hostilities, uh, you, ha you have virtual unanimity in, in the United Nations against uh, Israel. Uh, if you read analyses of the 1967 war by Israeli scholars, they'll say, well, the Security Council didn't uh, uh, criticize us in 1967, therefore we must have been in the right. Uh, but if you look at what was actually said, uh, the, the issue was simply uh, avoided. Uh, and I will stop. Thank you. Wonderful. Fascination. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Um, and now pass to um, our uh, second panelist. Um, we have a co-author paper. Um, and uh, let me just introduce the, the speakers uh, first. Uh, um, so Dr. Jessica uh, White, who is uh, a senior lecturer in cultural and social analysis at the University of Western Sydney in Australia and an Australian Research Council DECRA fellow. I did my homework and I found out what DECRA means, uh, which is the Discovery Early Career Research Award uh, fellow. Um, congratulations. Um, she's a political theorist uh, whose uh, work integrates political theory, intellectual history, and political economy to analyze uh, contemporary form of sovereignty, human rights, and uh, humanitarianism. Uh, I just want to single out her forthcoming book, uh, which is the models of the market, uh, human rights and the rise of liberalism, which should come out next year. Um, the second um, uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Iab Schalbach, who is currently a visiting research fellow at the University of Sydney. Uh, his uh, work is at intersection of intellectual history, sociology of knowledge, and political theory. Um, his research is focusing primarily on uh, a form of knowledge and politics uh, and has written uh, quite uh, extensively on think tanks, human rights, NGOs, and on development of American pragmatism. Uh, again, I want to single out a couple of publications, um, the latest uh, being uh, uh, The Birth of the Think Tank, uh, RAND, you know, the, the famous US uh, think tank, and the development of technocratic worldview, which I look forward, having spent many years in think tank, I'm very interested in this book, and um, uh, The Triumph of Managerialism, New Technologies of Government and the Implications for Value. Thank you very much. And I'd like to also thank Victor and Brian and also all the staff at the Middle East Institute. It's really fabulous to be here and we're really pleased to be part of this opportunity and this discussion. So in a keynote address at the 2017 Israel Defence Forces International Conference on the Law of Armed Conflict, the founding father of international law studies in Israel, Yoram Dinstein, argued that the biggest contemporary challenge for international law is the direct participation of civilians in hostilities. Dinstein argued that the revolving door of so-called farmers by day, fighters by night, is an area still shrouded in doubt. He rejected the position of the International Committee of the Red Cross, according to which civilians lose protection against direct attacks only for the duration of a specific act of direct participation in hostilities. Instead, Dinstein argued for what he called a continuum approach that would deny civilian status to members and supporters of armed groups who serve, in his words, as cooks, drivers, administrative assistants, and legal advisors, as well as to members of the political wings of armed groups. Today, the prevalence of such arguments testifies to what Neve Gordon and Nicola Perugini have described as the evisceration of one of international law's foundational figures the civilian. While Dinstein himself argues elsewhere that, and I quote, the armed forces of a civilized country are rarely likely nowadays to target civilians with premeditation, 
The very claim, nonetheless, to be engaged in a civilised form of conflict has served to morally elevate the violence of the strong and to call into question the civilian status of supposedly uncivilised adversary populations. In order to understand the contemporary evisceration of the civilian, we need to return to a key moment in the construction of the principle of distinction, the drafting of the 1977 additional protocols to the Geneva Conventions. In 1974, the Inter International Committee of the Red Cross sponsored a diplomatic conference on the reaffirmation and development of international humanitarian law applicable in armed conflicts. While the ongoing war in Vietnam profoundly shaped the conference, here we focus on the place of Palestine in the drafting debates and the tensions generated by the attempt by the Palestine Liberation Organization, which was present in the proceedings, to frame its continuing national liberation struggle in legal terms. At that conference, the belatedness of the PLO's national liberation struggle, which remained unresolved after so many others had been victorious, gave Palestine a central place in the discussions about how international law should regulate anti-colonial conflicts. The most significant outcome of these discussions is Additional Protocol 1's recognition that the situations to which the protocol applies include armed conflicts in which people are fighting against colonial domination and alien occupation and against racist regimes in the exercise of their right to self-determination. This has typically been seen as a significant victory for national liberation movements, both by their opponents and by representatives of these movements themselves. <coughs> During the final session of the conference, the PLO representative, Chalki Armely, expressed deep satisfaction that in his words, the international community had reconfirmed the legitimacy of the struggles of peoples exercising their right to self-determination. Yet this victory came at a price. In order to inscribe themselves within a legal framework established to regulate conflicts between states, national liberation fighters were required to constitute themselves on the model of states. At the most basic level, complying with the protocols meant accepting the principle of distinction and avoiding indiscriminate attacks on civilians. Throughout the conference, PLO representatives declared themselves willing to do so. The PLO would sign the conference's final act Amelie told the conference, not only for the protection of the civilian population of Palestine, but also for the greater good of its adversaries, since it was ready to comply with all principles of the protocols. This meant not only that combatants must distinguish themselves from the civilian population while they're engaged in an attack or in military operation preparatory to an attack. More seriously, it meant accepting the conceptual principle that national liberation fighters are distinct from the civilian population. For a national liberation movement whose political legitimacy rested on the claim to be fighting a people's war and thereby reconstituting a people, this was not without tensions. But nor was the principle of distinction ever adequate to the specificities of the Palestinian struggle against a settler colonial power that denied the status of the Palestinians as a people. The decision by the PLO to frame itself as waging a people's war reflected the belief that their adversaries were not fighting a limited war, but a war against the people. According to the standard account of the diplomatic conference, the victims of war were largely forgotten during the drafting, as a Red Cross observer put it at the time, as delegates from national liberation movements focused their energies on extending international status to wars of national liberation and securing privileged belligerent status and POW protections for anti-colonial fighters. Yet the violence done to civilians by, by colonial powers was in fact a regular topic of discussion during the conference. Charging Israel with daily crimes against humanity, the PLO delegate Amelie put forward three fundamental principles for the consideration of the conference including protection of the civilian population against the atrocities committed by colonialist and racist powers. Amelie singled out the use of arbitrary detention, collective reprisals, forcible displacement, the destruction of homes and other objects without military value, and the use of cruel weapons. The criticism that anti-colonialists ignored the plight of civilians echoed the position taken by the major military powers throughout the conference depicting themselves as the guardians of what they depicted as the traditional and humanitarian understanding, 
according to which an international armed conflict was fought between the regular fighters of juridically equal states. The major military powers argued that any concession to the rights of irregular fighters would weaken compliance with the laws of war and expose civilians to harm. They argued, as David Forsyth puts it, that people should not be regulated by rules developed to regulate the conduct of states, as peoples lack the responsibilities and the capabilities of states. While national liberation movements, including the PLO, sought to extend international status to national liberation struggles and combatant status to national liberation fighters, their opponents argued that only confining this status to regular soldiers would secure the protection of civilians. As the scale of the Arab state's defeat in 1967 became apparent, the modern Palestinian national liberation movement emerged to announce the emergence of the Palestinians as a political subject after 21 years of political living death in refugee camps across the Levant. In a matter of a few years, the guerrilla movement institutionalized itself through the Palestine Liberation Organization, which came to embody a national political identity capable of making claims for repatriation and self-determination. The figure of the guerrilla fighter at once symbolized the emergent Palestinian identity and the assertive Palestinian agency. As the late Edouard Said put it in his 1970 article, The Palestinian Experience, in Amman today, two ways of life enclose all other ways, which finally connect the two. These two being a refugee in a camp and being an active member of one of the resistance groups. Throughout the 1970s, much of the BLO effort went into articulating the moral, political, logistical, and juridical connection between the refugee and the resistance, or put differently, between the farmer and the fighter. For a dispossessed population deprived of the material means of self-reproduction, armed struggle served as the central locus of self-reconstitution. The imaginary and language of armed struggle, as Yassid Saig argues, gave new substance to the imagined community of the Palestinians. Echoing the, the Vietnamese struggle, the various Palestinian guerrilla factions conceived of their fight as a people's war. This designation lacked the sociological precision that it had in Vietnam, as Sire notes. But it signified that what was at stake was a struggle about who the Palestinians are, who they were, and who they could be. In this sense, Said saw the Palestinian struggle in the 1970s as an effort at repatriation, an early transition from being in exile to becoming a Palestinian once again. Becoming Palestinian again involved the immediate task of negating marginality and political silence. In his first speech to the United Nations General Assembly in 1974, Yasser Arafat, the chairman of the Palestine Liberation Organization, depicted the strategy of what he called Israeli settler colonialism as an attempt to reduce the Palestinians to disembodied spirits fictions without a presence, without traditions or a future. Symbolically, Arafat was giving the floor by Abdel Aziz Bouteflika, who had accepted the presidency of the General Assembly one year earlier on behalf of those he referred to as generations of freedom fighters who contribute to making a better world with weapons in their hands. Speaking in the name of the people, of the people of, Pal of Palestine, Arafat began by acknowledging Bouteflika's place in what he termed the vanguard of the freedom fighters in their heroic Algerian war of national liberation. Yet if Algeria was once the inspiration for anti-colonial guerrilla fighters, it was now also a model for both colonial states. Appealing to those statesman who had once stood in the position of the rebel that he now occupied, Arafat asked that 
having converted their own dreams into reality, they now share his revolutionary dream. Yet, the United Nations was not a place for revolutionaries. The belatedness of the Palestinian National Liberation Movement inscribed Arafat's dream with a clear teleology, from the rebel to the statesman, from the people to the state. The PLO had learned much of the Algerians, just as they learned from the Vietnamese. In the immediate wake of 1967 war, in August 1967, the Palestinian faction Fatah published 14 pamphlets in, in the series Revolutionary Studies and Experiences, including one on the Vietnamese Revolution and a shorter study of the Algerian Revolution. They position themselves as part of what Paul Thomas Chamberlain calls a new global political geography that united the forces of liberation, Palestine, Cuba, Vietnam, China, and Algeria against the forces of imperialism, the United States, Rhodesia, South Africa, and Israel. In March, in March 1970, when Arafat and his deputy Salah Khalaf traveled to Hanoi for a two weeks tour, General Jiab told them, the Vietnamese and the Palestinian people have, um, have much in common, just like two people suffering from the same illness. One aspect of that illness, illness both parties believe, was they were faced with adversaries who refused to spare their civilian populations. The Fatah newspaper greeted the Malay massacre, for instance, by explicitly linking it to the massacres that enabled the founding of Israel as a state. Vietnam has its Daria scene, the headline read, referring to the 1948 massacre in a town whose name had become to optimize Zionist atrocities. Even as Arafat addressed the UN, armed struggle continued to play a central ro role in the transformation of Palestinian identity which ceased to mean that one is a refugee, a second-class citizen, and became a source of a pride. As Yusuf Shahidi puts it, the Palestinian has become the fidai, or revolutionary, who bears arms. Armed struggle came to be the locus around which the various cultural, political, and social elements that constituted the Palestinian people as a national group evolved. Both 1967 Palestinian now named a collectivity with a specific, specific historical experience and a clear political demands. For Israel, it was this reconstitutive effect of the armed struggle more than its military effectiveness that was of utmost concern. Armed struggle signified the return of the dead, the undoing of the political living death of the Palestinians. Much of the Israeli counter-effort therefore went into dissolving the connection between the fighter and the refugee, the fedayeen and the civilians. As Colonel Shlomo Gazit, head of intelligence coordination in the occupied territories put it, Israel's aim, and I quote, was to isolate the terrorist from the general population and deny him shelter and assistance, even though the natural sympathy of that population is with the terrorists and not with the Israeli administration. <coughs> Just as the PLO learnt from the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong, the Israelis learnt from the US counterinsurgency operation mm -hmm. in Vietnam. Four years before Arafat's visit to Hanoi, Moshe Dayan, who would become Israel's defence minister, toured South Vietnam to study the American war effort. Although he concluded that for all their military superiority, the US could not eradicate support for North Vietnam's independence struggle, he nonetheless refused to view the Palestine, Palestinian fedayeen as a similar political threat. Palestinian nationalism was a fabrication, he believed, as there could be no authentic Palestinian political identity. <coughs> the Israeli response to the emergence, re-emergence of the Palestinian movement ultimately embraced an eliminatory logic. In a 1969 interview, then Israeli Prime Minister Golda Meir famously said, there were no such thing as Palestinians, they did not exist. Militarily, Israel launched collective punitive reprisals and targeted assassinations against Palestinian communities and spokespersons to weaken and destroy the emergent Palestinian movement. <clears throat> 
While Israel sought to isolate the fighters from the people, Palestinians, on the other hand, always rejected Israel's claims that its attacks were targeted solely at the fighting elements. The principle of distinction, as Avishai Margalit and Michael Walzer have argued, presumes that war should be a conflict between states, not nations or peoples, and that whatever becomes of the armies and whatever the casualties, in their words, the two nations, the two peoples, must be functioning communities at war's end. Yet this presupposition could never ground the rules of a conflict in which one party denied the very existence of the other as a people. As Rashid Khaldi observed at the 2014 war on Gaza, Israel's attack has been seen universally among Palestinians as a war on their entire people, not on Hamas. In reality, Israel has impeded Palestinian life since 1948 in ways that have often made the distinction between civilian and non-civilian immaterial. In the Israeli case, the overall eliminatory logic of settler colonialism took precedence over the logic of limited war. The conviction that Israel was not waging a limited war, but one aimed at dissolving the political and moral personhood of the Palestinians, made it difficult for the Palestinians to inscribe their experience in the language of international humanitarian law. In speaking the language of international law, the Palestinians were torn between their own specific need to codify a normative framework for a people engaged in an existential struggle against a colonial settler enterprise and the realities of a law designed to regulate the conduct of limited wars between states. For some sections of the Palestinian movement, the lack of discrimination on Israel's part and the nature of settler colonialism justified targeting Israeli civilians. The Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine military commander Abu Hammam, for instance, argued that Israel's military reserve system meant that Israeli civilians were in fact military personnel in civilian clothes, the equivalent of farmers by day, fighters by night, and had played a central role in driving out the Arab population from the occupied homeland. During the proceedings of the ICRC diplomatic conference, the PLO and the Israeli delegate both accused the other of violating the principle of distinction and attacking non-military targets. The Israeli delegate drew attention to a 1977 article in which he told the conference, I quote, an organization called the Palestinian Democratic Freedom Front claimed credit for two guerrilla actions one against an oil storage depot, which had killed some workers, and another against a Jerusalem vegetable store, which had killed and wounded, in his words, a large number of Zionists. Such were the military objectives attacked by the Palestinian rebels, he argued. They not only attacked them, but boasted of having done so. At another point in the conference, the PLO's Armali responded to the statement of the Israeli delegate that Israeli forces had attacked only military targets objectives by asking, had the Arab population of the village of Deir Yassin been a military objective? The Palestinians coming of age as a national liberation movement was largely out of sync with the great decolonization struggles. They shared both the liberationist and the status aspiration of this struggle, but they achieved neither liberation nor a state. Their fight was not simply an asymmetrical a struggle against a technologically superior army. It was a fight for survival against a settler colonial adversary determined to impair the viability of the Palestinians as a people. In this context, the Palestinians' options ranged from complete erasure to qualified inclusion. To overcome uh, erasure, the, Palest the, the PLO spoke in the name of, of the people of Palestine to secure inclusion, they spoke the language of international institutions and international law. Over the years, in order to be accepted as worthy of law's protection in their pursuit of self-determination, the Palestinians had to speak the vocabularies of languages not necessarily their own. These languages offered the Palestinians political opportunities, but they came with political risks and limits. In particular, the effort to gain juridical recognition of the PLO made the Palestinians dependent on the support and acknowledgement of existing normative, institutional, and legal mechanisms that excluded them as a people and included them solely as a state in the making.
In acting as a state in the making, the BLO accepted the classifying logic of the law with its distinction between combatants and the non-combatants. Yet this distinction was inadequate to the permanent state of aggression faced by the Palestinians as a people. And as this Dennis Stein's uh, quantum approach to direct participation in hostilities made, makes it clear, in continually rearticulating the threshold between the combatant and the non-combatant, Israel construes and constructs Palestinians as inhabiting a threshold between civilians and combatants. Long after the BLO had declared its willingness willing, willing, to abide by the principle of distinction, Israel continues to view Palestine's farmers by day as fighters by night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.